Hi, everybody. Thank you. I have a cheering section. That's amazing. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Having a good I.O.? Just got a few more sessions to go. I'm glad that you made it out to this one. I'm Timothy Jordan, and this is Ubiquitous Computing with Google. Now, we've all been talking a lot lately about ubiquitous computing, IoT, wearables, and so on. And there's a lot we're going to be able to do together to make, help make our users' relationship to technology better. And this is the next step. And before I get started, please know that uh, you can give me feedback. The IO overlords would like to know what you think of this and similar content, um, and this session in particular. So uh, just head over to the schedule, either on the app or the web, and tell us what you think. OK, so a year ago, I stood on this or a very similar stage, and I talked to you about wearable computing with Google. I put forth this idea of computing that was more about the user than the device that they carried. And we explored the implications of that in code design by looking at the problem through MVC. Simple and straightforward uh, thinking about this space. Today, we're going to take those ideas and build upon them. In this session, we're going to take a deeper look at the platforms and tools that can make your app available on a variety of form factors, not just across wearables, but something that's available on your television and in your car and someday even more places. And we'll explore the implications of that design through code that you can check out and compile today. Let's get started. So first off, what is ubiquitous computing? It's simply a fancy phrase for technology that's accessible to the user whenever and wherever they want or need it. Right? That's it. It could be outside when they're going for a bike ride, or having some friends over to watch cat videos, or maybe it's time for a road trip. Your users could be in any of those situations, and you don't want them to have to think about what device they need to get to to get to your service. Instead, you're going to want an experience that presents itself to the user wherever it makes sense by building an app that runs on whatever device they have nearby. Now, many people look at the evolution of computing like this, right? It's always about the next device. Big computer, little computer, littler computer. What's the next thing in this linear progression? But really, our present and future looks quite a bit different. It looks a lot more like this, right? We use a bunch of technology in different ways, and we often do that simultaneously. In fact, the growth of these connected devices is staggering. Although the number in 2020 depends uh, uh, on who you ask, it can be a little bit different, it's always more than you can imagine. Now, I didn't throw up the units here. Does anybody want to tell me what the units are there? Millions? It's billions. 200 billion devices in 2020. And you can actually break this number down, because 200 billion is sort of like this abstract number. Think of it this way. 26 smart devices for every human on the planet in 2020. <laughs> That's a lot. Now, not everybody has 26 in their pockets at the same time, right? This is across industries. But think about the number of smart devices that are going to be and already are in our world. Here's another number for you. I think this is really interesting, especially for us, right? Uh, Gartner has estimated half of IoT solutions will be from startups less than three years old. Half. So the question really is, have you already started building for this reality? <laughs> the good news is it's not that hard to deal with, it, not, as, not as hard as it might seem. The explosion in form factors is manageable by having a strong core platform that lends itself to extensibility. So you can think less about a new project for each new device and more about a versatile solution that you can extend for new form factors as they become available. And these platforms that help you, they exist today. I'm going to show, show you a working example in a bit. But before we dig into some code, this is what it looks like logically. Now, the traditional approach to supporting different devices is to make an app for each device and platform as they become available and adopted by users. <laughs> like my animation? 
<laughs> this is typically meant a new project for each and every device developed and supported independently, which is crazy. And the ironic thing is that we as developers are already thinking about this experience um, as part of a single whole experience for the user across devices. It's just silly to approach these as separate projects. Instead, you want to take the longer lens view. Think about having a view into your service from each and every device that makes sense. Your model and controller are on a central device or in the cloud, but then each, uh, the wearable and the living room and the car is a different view into that service. And this is the definition of ubiquitous computing again, right? It's where your service is available anywhere and everywhere. Now, each view into your service is going to differ slightly, right? It's going to look a little bit different on the wrist than it will in the car. And that's what you want to spend your time on. You don't want to have to spend your time on figuring out the glue in between all these things. And uh, so what we'll do is we'll jump right into best practices here so that we can think about how to conceptualize that experience. And people no longer need to sit at a desk to get the benefits of technology. And experiences that we build can do more than just allow for that usage, right? As, I'm, as I've been saying, they can assume that usage throughout the day and in the world. They can do more than just work nicely with existing technology in our lives. They can work seamlessly across all of it. Now, with that in mind, these best practices um, will help us navigate the issues, big and small, that we develop uh, in this way. Um, and a note about these best practices is that they're guidelines that apply to your experience on each device as well as the greater experience across all devices, which is a great litmus test for best practices in this area. Right? It make them great for ubiquitous computing when you're thinking about both the smaller picture and the bigger picture across everything at the same time. And the first one is sort of obvious, simple. And think about it this way. The user experience should be so simple that it feels effortless, almost magical. In the long run, users always prefer simplicity and reliability over quantity of features. Whatever user problem you solve, make sure to address that really well and never get in the way of that solution. A great example of this is a messaging app. I love messaging on Android Wear. I get a message, and I can reply by voice. It's so intuitive and simple. It just, it just makes sense. The next one is contextual. Now, being contextual is really about being relevant. Take into account the time, the location, and even the activity that the user is involved in to provide them with the most useful experience wherever they happen to be. Now, as an example, I love the idea of a shopping list that automatically comes up as I get into the store. right? And before I leave, maybe sends me a notification of any items I might have missed. In this case, we're providing information to the user um, before they have to ask, right? Because we're taking into account their context for them, which leads me to this idea. The experience should be so fast that it should feel immediate. Now, being contextual uh, can help with this, right? But it's also about micro interactions. Remember that you're not trying to distract and occupy the user. You want to present just the right information right away so that they can get what they need and keep living their lives. A great example of this is voice search on Android TV. The user can say what show they want to watch, and any app that's set up for search can launch that content for them. Another great example is autoplay and queuing on Google Cast. The next episode can just come right on so that the user doesn't have to stop and find it when they're binge watching, as I do on the weekends. The last thing is extensible. And you're going to want to build your app and experience to be as extensible as possible. Where are the places that your user will want to use your service in the future? And how can you build that into your core app now so that the overall experience uh, that the user has is in hand whenever and wherever it makes sense for them? So those are them. Oh, uh, an example on this, music. I love listening to music wherever I want. And it turns out I, I think everybody's that way. That might be you know, um, at home in the living room. That might be on the go while I'm on a, a run or in the car. So there you are. 
a handful of principles to help you refine the design of your user experience and reach your users in an undeniably useful way. That's really key. We found when working with developers that these guidelines, uh, they help the most when working with new form factors, understanding right away how to contextualize and measure your work for success. And that's why we created a design sprint technique for learning the design principles for new form factors in particular. And the material for one, in, one of these design sprints was just launched yesterday morning on developers.google.com. And many of you who arrived at the session early may have found a playbook on your seat. Uh, design sprints are a great way to learn immediately um, and to try out uh, design principles for these new form factors. And then you can apply them to your own project with the comfort of familiarity. All right, let's look at a practical solution, shall we? One that you can download, compile, adjust, and learn from. A sample code usually just shows you a narrow view at a partial solution which is great if you want to know just how one thing works. However, when you want to see how everything fits together, you need a fully functioning example. Now, this is particularly important for building across devices, because how everything fits together is the thing. And we recently released a simple but complete app just for this purpose. Uh, this is not the only kind of thing that you can build to be ubiquitous, remember that. But rather, it's just a look at one kind of app and how it can be built with these ideas in mind. The universal Android music player. Remember I was just talking about listening to music everywhere? This app helps you do that. And it works on your phone, your watch, your television, both Android TV um, soon and uh, Google Cast and of course, your car. And it's completely open sourced on GitHub. There's the URL. Now let's say you have a media app that's built around an activity. Right? This is pretty common. And that was just fine for an app on a device. But if you wanted to support more devices, what you'd usually do is you'd either expand that activity or you'd create new ones for each new device. And it's still not so bad until you realize that you probably have to revisit your app's overall design each and every time to coordinate new message passing, play locks, and that kind of thing. Instead, you're going to want a solid core central service that extends easily to each new form factor. Now, there's an Android API that makes this straightforward. UAMP is built around this, Media Browser Service and Media Session. Now, this is the way that you would build your app on Lollipop so that you could have media keep playing in the background, uh, be controlled from the lock screen, and so forth. It's also a great way to allow multiple devices to act as consumers of a central service rather than everything built in activities that need to independently coordinate. The media browser service maintains a tree structure of all your media, such as a collection of music. Now, this could be either streamed or stored locally. Media Session tracks the current sta state of what your app is playing. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Everything, whether it's your phone app, Android TV, Android Auto, they're all consumers of the Media Browser Service and Media Session. Now, let's say you've got your, your phone hooked up to, say, Android Auto, like this. So the, the companion app on the left um, that's the Android at Auto companion app. And that app is responsible for drawing the user interface and sending those pixels to the vehicle display. This uh, app also connects to the media browser service. And it queries it to get the tree structure of your app's media library. The driver of the car then selects a song, either the touchscreen or through voice search. And then Android Auto will use Media Session to run your callbacks. Now, this is great on Android Auto because as a developer, you never have to worry about the details of making a user interface that's safe for driving. Android Auto takes care of all of that for you. It just needs the music service available to get the data and handle playback. And the app on the left, it could be anything. It could be Android Wear. It could be uh, just another activity in your same app handling Android TV, or maybe it's handling Google Cast. Any of these will work because of how it's set up. We don't have to rewire the app each and every time we add a new form factor. Instead, we have this solid central service that extends easily 
to each new form factor. You simply access the music service from any context that makes sense for your user. Now remember what I said earlier, this is certainly not the only way to make a ubiquitous app or the only ubiquitous app that makes sense. This simply gives you an idea of how to structure a common app at, such as a music player for extensibility. The specific APIs you use are of course going to depend on your use case, how you implement the best practices we talked about, and where you keep your model and your controller. It could be on the phone, it could be in the cloud, it could be wherever that makes sense for your service. Let's take a look at a few examples of apps shipped and available to users that are doing this kind of thing today. iHeartRadio, it brings uh, radio, music, news, podcasts, sports, and more to users. And you can even make your own custom stations. It's easy to use and it's free. I love this app. And best of all, my favorite thing, is it's available wherever I go. It's on Android Wear, you can cast to your TV, you can even use it in the car. Another great app is WhatsApp Messenger. It's great for messaging, sending photos, group chat, and a lot more. And it's been available for phones for a long while, and it's also available on Android Wear and Android Auto. Do you see the pattern here? <laughs> this is one of those applications like music where you expect it to work everywhere, and it does. You can keep the conversation going, whether you're waiting in line with your phone, on a walk with your watch, or a quick road trip with your car. And last, Cookbook. Cookbook aims to bring users the joy of cooking and sharing with recipe search, calculated prep time, shopping lists, and more. And if you're like me, you like to get as, uh, everything as messy in the kitchen as possible which is great because it works on all the things that can get messy. Uh, it works on uh, the phone. Uh, you can also load your recipes up on your watch or your TV as well. Now, if you'd like to do with your app what these apps have done, uh, you can find a lot more detail on the ubiquitous computing course that's launching on Udacity in the coming weeks. It's part of the Android Nano degree and it's gonna be available very soon. It covers wearables, living room, and auto in much more detail than we talked about today. There's an old saying that I keep coming back to uh, when we're thinking about this space. Sometimes when building apps, when we're all guilty of this, uh, we forget to see the forest for the trees, right? Which is to say, we get so focused on that one thing in front of us that we forget that we're building a relationship with the user across their life, across their technology. And to be really valuable, we should be present in their life whenever it makes sense to them. To this end, we should build with ubiquity in mind from the beginning and extend to new form factors over time. The tools and design knowledge that are required for this are available and they're at your fingertips. We just need to get started and then we're going to find out how much further we can go. For example, the Works with Nest program is making the potential of the thoughtful home real. You can learn more on their website. Also announced yesterday was Project Brillo. This is an operating system for the Internet of Things. It's derived from Android and able to run on devices with a minimal footprint. Core functionality includes connectivity and scaled management. And of course, when you pair with Weave, also talked about yesterday, setup and discovery becomes effortless for the user. And devices can all be compatible and work with each other. This is the future of what we do. And we should get together and we should talk about it more. So also announcing today, we're going to do just that. I hope you can join us for our first conference on ubiquitous computing as we get together as friends across companies and industries to work towards more interoperability and ultimately more value for all of our users. Please head to this link to sign up and be the first in line to hear more. And if you like, let us know what you want from this conference. Maybe you want to speak or maybe there's another way you want to get involved. Let's build this together. Please dive in and learn uh, so that you can reach your users in even more places and we can really start to have a deep conversation about all these things. Now, uh, over here in the area to my right, you'll see all these people in lovely red shirts. We're actually going to be taking Q&A 
as a group out in the sandbox. We hope you join us there. We can play with devices. We can talk about your specific apps. And we can really um, engage in a conversation right out in the sandbox. Thank you very much.